Well, a very good morning, everybody. Hello. Hello. How are we doing, everybody? Okay? It's the last day. It also means that it is our fantastic guest speaker, Jeff Peters. It is his final talk today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell, give you a little bit of background. When Jeff joined the ship, um, he was only expected to do so many talks. And I said, have you got some more just in case? <laughs> I never thought we'd be going on this long, but I have to say, Jeff's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, so many extra talks. And so, ladies and gentlemen, for the final time, a warm welcome to the stage, Mr. Jeff Peters. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick, and uh, thanks for the extra pressure there. That's great. So today I'm going to be talking about the, um, the Lost Franklin Expedition, and some of you might already know a little bit about this story, but hopefully you learn a bit about it as well. But ever since Marco Polo first ventured overland from Europe, from Italy, all the way to China and discovered the enormous riches and the incredible trading opportunities of the Far East, man had been looking for a way to get to that region faster, safer and more efficiently. Now the only two sea routes that were available from Europe we're coming all the way down the Atlantic and either following the way the Vasco da Gama pioneered and around the bottom of South Africa and all the way across the Indian Ocean, or as we now know, around the bottom of South America, like um, Magellan had uh, pioneered, and all the way across the Pacific Ocean. But both of these routes were more than 10,000 nautical miles long. They took more than a year to get there and they were fraught with danger. And over the years, hundreds of ships and tens of thousands of seamen, their passengers, and their very precious cargoes were lost to the sea. So it was thought that there had to be a better way. And that, that way might be, there might be a passage to the Pacific, uh, to the north and west of Europe, the famous Northwest Passage. And over the years, uh, some of the greatest explorers in history had gone in search for the passage, men like um, uh, William Frobisher, John Cavett, Henry Hudson, William Parry had all looked from the Atlantic side and Cook and La Perouse had looked from the Pacific side with to no avail. But if you could find it, it would take 6,000 nautical miles off the journey. And for the country that was able to find it and control it, it would be an economic bonanza. Incredible sort of wealth that would come from it. And we, we know that in winter, as the ice uh, marches down from the north and crushes into those northern bays and in inlets along that Canadian northern coast, there was no way that a ship could get through. But it was thought that come spring and summertime when the ice melted and retreated north again, perhaps there was a way through that maze of islands and, and um, rocks and, and ice flows around that area out into the Pacific. Now, Sir John Barrow was the second secretary of the Admiralty for over 40 years from 1804. He was the man that um, the, now the permanent secretary was based on, the role of permanent secretary was based on, on John Barrow. He had an enormously successful career. He was a hero to the Royal Navy even though he had never fought in any type of battle. He was the man that is seen to have guided the Royal Navy and made it the most professional and a powerful navy in the world at the time. He had brought in innovative ship designs that were bigger and faster and stronger than, than other ships. He brought in uh, uniform training and that was the best training anywhere in the world. So a, an officer or a sailor could go from one ship to any other ship in the fleet and they didn't know exactly what their role was. He was the first man to introduce war games for, um, for the military where they could practice against each other before they went for the real thing and uh, they'd practice uh, naval warfare tactics amongst themselves and over the period of time those warfare tactics developed and became even better. He enshrined in legislation the notion that promotions to any rank were based entirely upon merit and not who your family was or uh, what sort of money you had or the connections that you have, it was all to be on merit. And he had guided the Royal Navy through wars against the French, the, uh, the Dutch, the Americans during the War of 1812. He had guided the Navy through wars against piracy and slavery. And those wars had been fought, they had been won, and then he turned the resources of the Royal Navy to become scientific endeavours and just, uh, to go and discover other places around the world and, and learn more about them. And over the years, 
what we learnt um, because of John Barrow and his expeditions, you know, you know, gave us a lot more knowledge about the world and how it worked. So a great man, but he was coming to the twilight of his career and he wanted one more triumph and he wanted the big one this time. Uh, so he commissioned the best resourced, most scientifically advanced mission of all time up until that date and he was going to try and find the Northwest Passage once and for all. But he knew if he was going to achieve this, he needed to have the right man for the job to lead this expedition. And before he could, he knew exactly who he wanted, but before he could ask that man, he had to go through some protocols and stroke some egos. So the first man he actually asked was a man by the name of Sir William Edward Parry. Parry was the foremost Arctic explorer of his generation, a wonderful explorer. He'd gone looking for the Northwest Passage several times to no avail. In uh, 1827, he uh, went on a sledging expedition and he set a, a record for furthest north, closest to the North Pole, and that record stood for more than 50 years. But he was now 60 years old, which, no offence, but 170 years ago, that was uh, <laughs> 175 years ago, that was considered old, and his exploring days were behind him. But because of his status, he had to be the first person asked, even though everyone knew that he had declined the offer of command. And he did get decline, and that meant that um, Barrow could ask the man that he really wanted to lead this expedition, and that was Sir James Clark Ross. Now, he was your quintessential British hero. Uh, tall, dashing, brave, handsome. He was considered to be the most handsome na man in the Royal Navy, if not all of England. He had a lot of experience, though, as well. He had gone to the Arctic three times with his uncle, Sir James Ross, and uh, on one of those occasions, young uh, James had been the very first person to reach the magnetic North Pole. He um, had also gone to the Arctic twice with Parry himself, and the last occasion he was Parry's second in command during that, uh, that expedition. But most recently, he had had command of his own expedition to the other end of the world, to Antarctica. And this was an amazing expedition and probably needs 20 minutes just itself just to talk about uh, this expedition. Um, he took two ships and the discoveries that they made, well, we're still talking about them. Um, they made, uh, took measurements on, on magnetic, magnetic currents around the world and that improved navigation all over the world. They did lots of scientific work. Uh, they discovered more than 20 new species of plants and animals and birds and fish during that time. Um, some of the work that they did led to, uh, helped the next wave of British explorers to the Antarctic, like Scott and Shackleton and others. And he took his two ships, HMS Erebus and HMS Terror, and they sailed further south than any other ship had ever gone before. And uh, in fact, they still hold the record as further as south for a full sailing ship, still have that record intact. And uh, he discovered and named uh, Mount Erebus, which is the southernmost active volcano in the world after one of his ships, and he named Mount Terra, uh, which is another, island, another mountain in Antarctica, after his other ship. And in turn, the Ross Sea, which is south of New Zealand uh, and is the world's uh, biggest uh, non-fishing exclu uh, fishing exclusion zone, uh, is named in his honour, Ross Island, and the incredible Ross Ice Shelf, which is a plateau of ice, uh, like a, a prairie of ice, which stretches for, it's, it's bigger, it's twice the size of the entire United Kingdom. And they're all named in his honour. So an amazing explorer uh, and the perfect man to lead this expedition. But there was a problem. Um, he had just come back from that four-year expedition to uh, Antarctica and... Um, so I meant to mention there too that uh, during the winters while they were down in Antarctica, they wintered in Hobart and it will come clear uh, that comes relevant a bit later on. But the problem was that um, he had just come back from this four-year expedition and he decided to marry this stunningly beautiful young woman who was almost half of his age and he had promised his new wife that at the age of 44, his exploring days were over and that he would be by her side for the rest of his life. So when he was offered command of this extraordinary new ex uh, uh, chance to go to find the Northwest Passage, he had a choice to make. He could either break his promise to his new bride, which, gentlemen, we all know isn't the smartest thing in the world to do, <laughs> and he could go away for two, three, four years, who knows, with a bunch of smelly men on a cramped ship um, with awful food 
enduring the hardships of the Arctic, or option B, he could stay at home with his beautiful wife, start a family, and continue to be the darling of English society uh, that he was at that time. And funnily enough, who knows why, he chose option B. <laughs> and he declined the offer of command. But he recommended to Barrow the man that he thought should command this mission. And that was his best friend, the man that had been best man at his wedding, and more importantly, the man that had been second in charge on that great um, expedition to the Antarctic, and that was Francis Crozier. And Crozier was the next best person qualified to lead this, ex uh, this mission. He was uh, very well regarded and respected by his men. He had saved the expedition to Antarctica on at least a couple of occasions by his uh, brilliant seamanship. He had almost as much experience as Ross in, in uh, Arctic ex uh, exploring. But there was a problem with Crozier as well. The first and foremost was that he was Irish. And there was no way that the English were going to allow the prestige of <laughs> discovering the Northwest Passage go to anyone other than an Englishman, but especially not an Irishman. And the other problem was that a lot of people, including Crozier himself, thought that he was a brilliant second in command, but did he have the skills to command a mission of this importance and prestige? He wasn't good with media and with, um, with VIPs and things like that. So he couldn't do, I mean, he didn't enjoy doing the public speaking type of thing. So he was offered and he accepted the role of second in charge for this mission. And that meant that Ross and other people uh, put their support behind a man by the name of Sir John Franklin. Now, this was a very strange choice, because although Franklin was extremely popular in England, uh, he was 59 years old, so he was only one year younger than, than Parry. He wasn't in good health. He, um, he'd, the last time he'd been to the Arctic, uh, was 25 years before. The last time he commanded a ship at sea was more than 20 years before. But as I said, he was very, very popular and uh, everyone uh, ch praised the choice that had been made. In the, um, the Times editorial said that if a man of the calibre of Sir John Franklin had been chosen to lead this expedition, there was no chance anymore of any sort of failure. It would be, it was bound to succeed. He was born in Lincolnshire in 1786, the ninth of 12 children. He joined the Royal Navy when he was 14, and the following year he um, fought in the Battle of Copenhagen, which was one of Nelson's great victories. And then he travelled to Australia and was part of the, the very first circumnavigation of Australia by Matthew Flinders, and I spoke about that, looks, seems like a long, long time ago, the, uh, just after we left Fremantle. Um, and then in he went back to England in 1805. He was involved in the Battle of Trafalgar, once again, uh, Nelson's great victory. And then in 1819, he was given command of the Copper Mine Expedition. Now, this was an, a British, it was a Royal Navy expedition, but it was an overland expedition. And the idea was to travel to Hudson Bay, recruit some men, and then travel overland along the Copper Mine River to the very north coast of Canada and map that north coast once again in preparation for finding out more about the Northwest Passage, but it was a disaster. He went to Hudson Bay with four men, four Royal Navy, or three other Royal Navy men, and the idea was that he was supposed to recruit experienced trappers and uh, hunters, and because I'd have to live off the land during this expedition, which was 5,000 miles. And, uh, but when he got there, he found out that most of the trappers, which were known as travellers at the time, were, were Frenchmen. Uh, Britain and France had been at war several times in the previous few years, so these Frenchmen had no real interest in supporting the, the Royal Navy, now, especially when they found out that they were going to go all the way to this uncharted territory, no one had been there before, and that they were going to be paid basically Royal Navy wages, that's all they were going to be paid. So Franklin couldn't recruit people with experience, so he had to try, he had to eventually hire 16 men that didn't have very much or no experience whatsoever in the backwoods, and that would become a problem. But he had his orders, so he had to go. And he set out with these 20 men, and it was, even after a few months, it was obvious that um, things weren't going well. The, uh, the trappers that he'd taken couldn't find food, uh, and, or hunt food, they, they couldn't find any. The, uh, the Indians that they were supposed to try and liaise with and negotiate with and, and get their, their support and help from just ran away when they saw these white men. Um, 
they, their rations that they were taking were cut back piece by piece, part by part, so that they were, on, uh, so they were getting hungry and hungrier. And things weren't looking good. The, uh, they were supposed to make between 18 and 20 miles per day, every day. But they're only making around about an, an average of, uh, very rarely went over eight miles per day. And part of that was because Franklin was Royal Navy. He wasn't used to trampling uh, overland. Uh, they weren't used to carrying all this heavy equipment, navigational equipment with them. The heaviest thing a Royal Navy officer used to carry was a, a cup of tea and a crumpet at any one time. <laughs> so it was, they had to endure a severe winter. And at the end of that winter, the travellers said, OK, that's enough. This is ridiculous. We're going back. Franklin had to warn them, saying that you're being paid by the Royal Navy. You're under the Royal Navy Discipline Act. If you refuse to go any further, it's mutiny and I'll hang you. So they reluctantly decided to go on. Now, they had to go on because Franklin had his orders. He, um, he knew that this was, he had been given a mission. If he failed in that mission, he was never going to be given another opportunity like this again. So he had to keep pushing and going on. And eventually he did make it to that northern coast of Canada. But by this time, they were in desperate condition. They were starving. They were eating bark and moss to try and keep themselves alive. Franklin famously cut down his boots and ate the, um, the leather from his boots. And later on, there were stories told and songs written about the man who ate his boots, uh, which was Franklin. And um, Charlie Chaplin, growing up in London, remembered hearing these songs and these stories. And in his 1925 film, classic film, The, um, uh, the Gold Rush, he, um, he tells the story of the little tramp going into the Alaskan wilderness to find, make his fortune, only to become starving and have to resort to eating his own boots. And Chaplin credited Franklin for the inspiration to that story. But um, they eventually, Franklin decided, OK, well, that's enough. And they had to turn around. And the way back was even worse than the way getting there. And uh, 11 of the, um, of the 20 men died, mostly a terrible death through starvation. But at least one man was murdered by another member of the party and cannibalized by that man. Now, they were almost dead. And they were found by a, a friendly Indian tribe who nursed them back to health and, and took them to safety. The Canadian government was scathing in their criticising of Franklin. They blamed him for this. They said he was too obstinate and uh, was followed his orders, even though that was against any sort of common sense, and they blamed him for those 11 deaths. But when he got back to England, the English government were embroiled in their own controversy at the time, and they didn't need any more bad news. So the story was spun to be one of dedication to duty and leading his men out of the, the, uh, the wilderness against all odds. And he was turned into a hero. Uh, he was promoted to captain. He later received a knighthood. And he wrote a best-selling book about the copper mine experience. And then in 1836, he was made lieutenant governor of the uh, penal colony in Van Diemen's land, which we now know as Tasmania. And by all accounts, he did a magnificent job in this role. He and Lady Franklin were very, very popular. Uh, a governor in those days' role was to you know, host dinner parties and sign a few things and, and cut some ribbons. But Franklin was very hands-on, probably at the urging of his wife. And this was, he did a lot of good for the local community. He spent money on infrastructure projects, on uh, things like education. And Van Diemen's Land became the very first British colony anywhere in the world that offered uh, free education to all children, including the children of convicts. Uh, Lady Franklin set up a training centre for female convicts to teach them domestic duties and uh, cooking so that uh, they could uh, get jobs in the colony and, and marry um, uh, farmers, etc., in the colony uh, so they wouldn't re resort back to a life of crime. Now, the only people who didn't appreciate what he was doing were the bureaucrats from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, who were used to running all this themselves. They objected to him working out what the priorities were instead of what they wanted to do. So they objected back to London, saying that uh, Franklin was a petticoat governor, that he was under the thumb. Too, he, his wife had too much influence over, over him. So he was actually recalled to London prior to his term as governor uh, finishing, so basically sacked, which was extremely embarrassing uh, for Franklin, and he fought that for the rest of his life. 
And then in 1845, as I've said, he was appointed as the commanding officer of the Northwest Passage Expedition. And he was going to have Crozier as his second in charge. Now, these two men knew each other. Uh, they were very, very friendly. Uh, as I said before, during that expedition to the Antarctic, that four-year expedition, the, um, the ships had called into Hobart for the winters, and they stayed there for three months on each of those two years. And Ross and Crozier and the Franklins got on very, very well. Uh, they, often, they usually dined together, and they became very, very good friends. Uh, in fact, uh, Crozier fell in love with Franklin's niece, the beautiful Sophia, and he proposed marriage to her on two occasions, but she declined. Even though she loved him, she declined because he was an explorer, and he always would be, and she didn't want to marry an explorer who would go off for, for years at a time and maybe not come back at all. Uh, later, Sophia became the, um, the uh, secretary to Lady Franklin for the rest of her life, and she wrote a lot of poetry, and much of that poetry deals with the, her long-lost love who went away to sea and never returned, and that's uh, meant to be about Crozier. Now, the ships that they were going to take were the same two ships that um, Ross had taken with him to the Antarctic, the, uh, the Terror and the Erebus. And at 325 tons and 372 tons, I mean, they're small ships. The, um, the Arcadia is more than 84,000 tons, so you can get a, a, an idea of the size of these ships. But they were going to be modified like never before. Each of the ships were going to have four inches of steel plating put all the way around the hulls to protect them from the crushing effects of the ice. Um, in case, as everyone expected, or most people expected, they'd have to spend at least one winter trapped in the ice before they could get through to the Pacific. But the biggest innovation of all was that each ship was going to have a locomotive steam engine fitted onto the ship with the propeller that would propel the ship along at four knots. Now, that doesn't sound like much at all. Um, I mean, everyone in this theatre today, every single soul on this ship, every single human being living on this planet today has lived their entire lives in the age of the engine. So we can't really appreciate what sort of innovation this was. This was massive. Before this happened, if, you wanted to, if a ship wanted to leave port, you had to wait for the, the, um, the tide to be going out and the winds in your favour. The same thing with coming into a port. You couldn't steer against the tide or the current or the wind, uh, or it was very difficult to do so. You couldn't manoeuvre around things like because you relied on the wind. Um, if, with, with these, um, if, if you were getting forced towards a rock, the wind or the waves and the current were taking you towards a rock or a reef, that's where you were going to go. There, there was, you had no choice. But with these engines now, you could even, if you were getting into trouble, you could even put them into reverse and you could back out, which was science fiction at its time. So, I mean, it was just an incredible uh, innovation and now this mission could hardly fail. Each of the ships was going to have internal heating. So there was pipes put all around the inside of the ship and uh, those, the steam engines were going to pump hot water through the, those pipes to warm the, the inside of the ship, so it was going to be very, very comfortable for the sailors on board. And in the officers' section, these, um, these pipes had spigots or taps, and they could even do their washing, uh, have shaves, and make their tea from the water from, from these pipes. So that was going to be a great thing for them as well. Each of the ships had a library with more than a 1,000 books on board, uh, so once again, if they got stuck in the ice for a year, they'd have things to do. There was lots of costumes and games and props on board so they can uh, put on plays for each other. That was another innovation. But another great innovation was that someone had invented a way to put preserved food into these tin cans, and you could, that food would stay good for years and years to come. And they were going to take a three-year supply of this food with them on the expedition. They sailed from um, Greenwich in London on the 19th of May, 1845, with 24 officers and 110 men. If you read the newspaper accounts at the time, they're so confident. I mean, there's never any doubt about if this is going to be successful. It's all, the stories are all about when this is successful, what it'll mean to England when they, they find this route, um, the economic boost that would give to the country. They travelled to Disco Bay on the west coast of Greenland, the men wrote letters back home. Uh, they had a supply ship go with them to Disco Bay, and then all the supplies were transferred over to the other two ships. 
five men who were found to be unsuitable for the, for the expedition were sent home on the expedition ship. And then they set sail. And uh, two American whaling vessels saw, on the 29th of July, 1845, these American whaling vessels saw these two ships heading into the ice in Baffin Bay in, um, in Canada. And those whalers reported that the men, Franklin's men, lined the, the sides of the ships and were yelling and cheering and waving to the, to the whalers. And they were in, and obviously in high spirits. Now, Terra and, and Erebus are fantastic names for warships. In Greek mythology, Erebus is the, um, the name to the gates at the entrance to hell. Um, but they're not such great names for ships of discovery. And none of those 129 men who were lining the sides of the ships and cheering that day could know that they were about to enter their, go through their own gates of hell to the terror that lay ahead of them. Now, Lady Jane Franklin, um, she was a woman of enormous wealth for her time. Uh, she was also said to have great mental activity. I'm not sure whether that's supposed to be a subtle uh, insult or, or not, or a compliment. <laughs> she was a very popular woman. When her husband was governor of Tasmania, she visited all the other colonies in Australia and New Zealand and was, was very well received in all of those. She was the very first woman to travel overland between Melbourne and Sydney. And she bought 640 acres of land in the Huon Valley near Hobart, which is very fertile land. And she divided it up into farms. And she gifted those farms to 164 families with the idea that they create an industry and be able to employ other people within the colony. Uh, the French explorer, Baudin, had planted apple trees as a gift to local Aborigines when he'd been there 100 years before. And these trees had flourished. So she recommended to these farmers that they, perhaps they could grow apple trees. And when they did, these, these thrived again. And uh, apples were Tasmania's very first overseas export. And today, uh, Tasmania is known as the Apple Isle, all thanks to Lady Franklin. But after 18 months that husband had been away, she became concerned. And she went to the Admiralty and she said, I've got a bad feeling about this. We should do something. And they just basically patted her on the head and said, you know, we expected them to be away for a lot longer than this. They've got three years supply of food. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. But after she hadn't heard anything for two and a half years, she became even more concerned. And she started a campaign within Parliament and within the newspapers for the Admiralty to do something. And eventually they had to act. And this is a, a, a painting, a famous painting of the greatest names of the Admiralty of the time, the greatest Arctic explorers of their time, looking at maps and charts and working out where they're going to go and how they're going to get there to search for Franklin, who is the subject of the portrait in the background there. But one man who isn't in this painting is Sir James Clark Ross. He had already boarded a ship and gone in search of his two great friends, Crozier and Franklin, and he searched for two years to no avail. And the Admiralty also posted a reward for any information leading to the discovery of Franklin or information about Franklin, and this was 20,000 pounds or 100,000 US dollars. Pretty good exchange rate. If you'd like that now, if you could get it, wouldn't you? Five to one. Um, and this was a fortune at its time. So not only did um, official expeditions go searching for Franklin and his men, but also uh, private people uh, with ships went searching as well. And the very first clue we got was in 1850, which is five years after Franklin and his men had left. And this was at Beachy Island, where a ship came across three graves. And these were the graves of uh, Petty Officer John Torrington, uh, Royal Marine uh, Billy Brain, and Able Seaman John Hartnell. And these were young men. And they had their dates, of, all that information they had was their names and their dates of, of their death on the tombstones. So why had these young men, young fit men, died so soon into this expedition? There was no information there, no explanation about what they died from. There was no information about where Franklin intended to go next. So it posed more questions that it actually answered. And it turns out they went from Disco Bay in Greenland across to Beachy Island and then headed south down towards King William Island down here. But what they didn't know was that that winter of 1846 came very early and it was a very severe winter. So as they were 
sailing south. They didn't know that the ice was shadowing them, following them, catching up to them. And so only after a few weeks of escaping from the, the ice at Disco Bay, they were once more trapped in the ice. Now, the next thing we know about them came in 1854, which was nine years after Franklin and his men had sailed. The um, um, Scottish explorer, John Ray, went searching overland. This was basically the same route that uh, Franklin himself had taken as part of the copper mine expedition. And uh, he came across, when he got to that region, he came across an Inuit family. And uh, they had in their possessions items which obviously belonged to the Franklin expedition. There was badges and cutlery with the initials of them, of the officers on that cutlery. There was crockery, there was even weapons. And Ray questioned these Inuits and they said that on King William Island there was many, many dead men there. And um, he spent some time with the Inuits and they told him stories that they'd heard from other Inuits uh, that they'd come across during their travels. And one of these stories was that two Inuit hunters had come across a party of, uh, of at least 20 of these white men who indicated that they were starving. So the Inuit gave them some seal meat, which the, the men ravishly ate, uh, uh, chewed down. And then the men started pointing to the Inuit sled dogs and making gestures towards them. So the Inuit became fearful and they took off, leaving the men behind. Now, which sounds harsh, but you've got to remember that there was nothing in this region. There was very, very little food and these Inuit would, were only just surviving on the margins uh, as it was. There was. They struggled to feed their own families. There was no way, even if they wanted to, there was no way that they had enough resources to feed 20 hungry men as, in addition to their families. And if they'd actually lost their, their dogs, uh, it would have been devastating to them. They probably wouldn't survive, survive that. Now, the Inuit also said that they'd, um, these men had uh, resorted to cannibalism and there was evidence of bones in, in cook, cooking pots and things like that. And when Ray wrote his report back to London, he said that his countrymen had resorted, to, been forced into the last resource, and that was cannibalism. And when that report got published back in England, it caused a massive furor. Lady Franklin was furious at this. Uh, she said there's no way that her husband would be involved in cannibalism. It just wouldn't happen under his command. She threatened to sue Ray. Um, she uh, held up his reward money that he was deserving of. And she enlisted some, some high-profile help, including the author Charles Dickens. And there was a, a campaign against the Inuit, uh, discrediting the Inuit, saying that these were obviously robbers themselves. They'd robbed these dead bodies. How do we know they didn't actually kill Franklin and his men? If anyone cannibalised these men, it was probably the Inuit. So there was lots of, of uh, information spread about the Inuit, and their reports were, were largely ignored. The Inuit had told Ray where the ships were, where, where the ships had sunk, and where other items had, could be found as well, but everything was completely ignored. Now, one man thought that it was worth checking out, though, and that was a man by the name of William McClintock, uh, Sir Francis McClintock. He, um, he went to King William Island, and some of his men found a can of stones, and they dug into that can, and they discovered a metal box in, in there, and inside the metal box was a, a, a note on Admiralty paper, and the note was from Franklin. And it said, 28th of May, 1847, Her Majesty's ship Erebus and Terror wintered in the ice in latitude, blah, 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 having wintered in 46, 47 at Beachy Island. Now, that was a mistake. They didn't winter in Beachy Island in 46, 47. It was 45, 46. So, why had he made such a basic error uh, with that? Uh, having ascended Wellington Channel to latitude 77 and returned by the west side of Cornwallis Island. And it signed Sir John Franklin, commanding the expedition, and he finishes off saying, all well down there. Now, that note had obviously been buried in the, that can of stones, but it had been um, dug up again because around the outside of the note, was another message, a much more ominous message. And it said, 25th of April, 1848, Her Majesty's ships Terra and Erebus were deserted on the 25th, oh sorry, the 22nd of April, 
five leagues north northwest of this, having been beset since 12th of September 1846. So they've been trapped in the ice for three years. The officers and crews consisting of 105 souls under the command of Captain Crozier landed here in latitude blah blah. But then the big news, the shocking news. Sir John Franklin died on the 11th of June, 1847, and the total loss by deaths in the expedition has been to this date nine officers and 15 men. And it's signed James Fitzjames, captain of Erebus, and Crozier, the captain and senior officer. And Crozier is also scrawled and start on tomorrow, the 26th, for Backs Fish River. Backs Fish River was a thousand miles away. And just on the, um, the deaths, um, nine officers and 15 men. Now, that's more than a third of the officers that were on board. Um, why had the officers taken such a huge proportion of the deaths on board? That didn't make any sense either. They also found some other evidence. They found a longboat that had been, uh, been used by the men. They'd obviously tried to drag this longboat to safety. But once again, uh, in the longboat, there was, there was two skeletons, one of them clutching a, uh, a loaded uh, musket. But the, um, the longboat, there was more questions now than ever before because the longboat was pointing back to the latitude and longitude where the ships were, had reported to have been. So were they trying to get back to the ships? And if you were trying to escape over the ice, dragging this longboat with you for a thousand miles, you would only take with you the bare essentials which you would take to survive. But in this longboat, they found things like hairbrushes and combs and ornate mirrors. They found dress clothing, including uh, dress gloves and, and caps and, and spit polished shoes. Um, they found 40 pounds of chocolate, which was proof that no women were on this expedition because that would have been the first thing. <laughs> would have been the first thing to go, wouldn't it? But, um, but also, if you were starving to death, why wouldn't you eat this chocolate? I mean, it made no sense. And they, they found dozens of books in the, the lifeboat. They also found brass curtain rods. Why would you take brass curtain rods if you were trying to save your life? It made no sense whatsoever. But it seems that um, these men had tried to escape over the ice, dragging these, these longboats, and they tried to get their way along that western side of King William Island. And we know this because of all the bodies that have been found along that route. Some of those bodies are lying in, in like threes, where it looks like they've been in a tent, um, and perhaps they've been told that we'll come back for you, and they've, they've died waiting for, for rescue. And other bodies have just collapsed in, in the ice. And, um, but uh, there was also a lot of evidence about, of cannibalism as well. Um, there was bodies that were dismembered. There was uh, limbs that had been uh, taken off. There was uh, lots of bones that had cut marks in the bones and nicks and, and scrapes, obviously the, from the, the flesh being uh, filleted from, from those bones. So the men had uh, resorted to cannibalism. And when that was reported back to London, um, Lady Franklin wasn't so concerned about it anymore because there was evidence now that her husband had died before this expedition had uh, taken to the ice. So it wasn't under his command. And uh, McClintock and eventually Ray himself were, were granted the reward money that was owing to them. And this is some famous paintings of, of, the, of that uh, torment going through the ice. Now, there's a, a wonderful YouTube video that because of copyright and time constraints, I don't have time to, to show you. But um, if you look it up, it's just incredible. It's an experiment conducted a few years ago by the Royal Commandy and Mounted Police. And they took out a, a bunch of 105 recruits, so the same amount of men as Crozier had. And these were men that were fit and healthy. Uh, they hadn't been confined to a ship for three years. Um, they were wearing the latest in Arctic uh, weather, uh, sorry, clothing, not the, the garb that had been worn by these explorers back then. And they were bussed out to a location. They were given a hearty breakfast. Uh, they had took um, blood samples by giving them their finger a prick. And um, then they were taken outside, and there were three longboats lined up there. And uh, the same size and the same weight as, as Crozier and his men would have had back in the day. And they were split up into three teams, put into harnesses, and they were told to drag these longboats as fast as they could, or as far as they could, across the ice that day. That was only going to go for one day. And they started off at 9 o'clock, 
and there's a lot, you can see on the video, there's a lot of banter between the teams, you know, challenging each other, a lot of encouragement amongst each of the teams, and they drag them, these, uh, they're racing across the ice uh, against each other, and they come to natural obstacles in the ice, like fissures and things, and they've got to try and drag the boats over these obstacles and around them and through them, that sort of thing. Mid-morning, there's not so much uh, laughter going on. Lunchtime, they stop and they're given another hearty meal to go on with. And then in the afternoon, you see that things have settled down a bit. I mean, there's no banter at all. There's actually arguments between teammates, um, accusations about um, people not pulling their weight uh, during this time. Um, there's some injuries, some dislocated and broken fingers. The worst injuries was a, a broken collarbone uh, by, by one man. People are dropping out and falling into the snow exhausted and uh, Mounties are standing over them, yelling at them to get back on your feet and help your teammates. And then at five o'clock it's all brought to a halt and the men are put back on a bus and they're bused back to the original location and they're given a hearty dinner. Um, but you can see on the video that they're too, a lot of them are too exhausted to eat it. They're passed out, they're, they're asleep in the corners on the floor. They're asleep on the, on the tables with the plates of food beside them. They, the blood samples were taken again uh, to measure how many calories had been burnt. And on average, um, they're almost 8,000 calories per man burnt during that one day. And uh, just to compare that, an average marathon runner would use about um, 3,000 calories during a marathon. So this is you know, more than twice that amount. And do you know how far they were able to drag those boats that one day? Four miles. That was it, four miles. Uh, Crozier and his head men had 500 miles to get to the nearest blade of grass. They had 1,000 miles to get to any sort of civilization at all. They had absolutely no chance at all, and they must have known it. And uh, I'll they needed to take those boats because they had, King William was an island, so they had to cross over um, uh, water to get to, to safety. And along this route, they collected a lot of um, things, a tea canister, hat badge, um, a watch, pocket watch, but also lots of heavy things like cutlery and crockery um, that they, these men had taken with them, like carried all these things across the ice. Now, in 1981, some scientists from, the Canada, from Canada uh, lobbied the government to give them permission to exhume the bodies on Beachy Island, the only three people that had been found by, from the expedition uh, to conduct some experiments. And they were given permission, and I'm about to put a photo up here of the men as they were found, so if you're offended, look away. But these were Torrington, Brain, and Harrington. Uh, and though the bodies were in very good condition when they were when they were exhumed because of the permafrost that they were found in. And when the experiments were conducted on their internal organs, they found extremely high amounts of lead in their, in their bodies. Now, London was a very, very polluted city at that time, but the, the lead content in their bodies uh, was far in excess of what uh, the, the pollution would have accounted for. And so they needed clues about what had happened, and nearby they found a clue. And these were the tin cans that had been used to feed these men through this expedition. The company had used lead solder to seal these lead cans. Um, ironically, they'd been given the job. The, they won the contract to supply this food on April Fool's Day, 1845, which was only six weeks before the expedition was due to sail. This was by far the biggest contract that they'd ever received. It was a new company. This was new technology. So they had to hire in staff from outside, unskilled labour. And it was said that that lead solder was painted on like a paintbrush along to seal those cans. And that when the, the, um, the cans were put into boiling water to heat up the contents, the, the, uh, the lead solder would drip into the, the contents of the, um, the cans like candle wax. Now, the other problem, and maybe an exp exp uh, explanation for why so many officers uh, died during this expedition, was the steam engine. Remember I told you about the water that was circulated through the, the pipes in the, uh, in the ship? They were lead pipes. So when those men were washing themselves and cleaning their teeth or making their tea uh, or shaving with this water, it was contaminated. Now, the lead in there wasn't enough to actually kill someone, but 
it would have made them disorientated. It would have affected their reasoning and their decision-making ability. Uh, would have made them very confused. So maybe that's got something to do with some of the decisions that were made, some of the mistakes that we can see today. Now, one of the ships that went um, searching for Franklin and his men was HMS Resolute, which was the pride of the British Navy at its time. Uh, it went along with a flotilla of four other ships under the command of a, a newly promoted Commodore. And uh, when they got to Baffin Bay, the ice was, was harsh that year. So Resolute was the only one of the ships that could go forward into Baffin Bay. And it became trapped in ice, which was fine. The captain expected that to happen. So he sent out sledging parties uh, searching for information of Franklin and his men. Now, this wasn't going to be a, a rescue mission. By this time, everyone knew that they were dead. They were just trying to recover uh, what they could. And um, while they were, well, one of those sledging parties that was sent out came across HMS Investigator. It had left England three years before searching for Franklin and his men. It had been trapped in the ice for three years. The men were down to starvation rations by this stage. Um, and so they were very happy to see the men from the Resolute. They deserted the, uh, the investigator and travelled overland back to the Resolute. The captain of the Resolute sent a messenger to his flotilla commander, the Commodore, telling him what had happened. The Commodore, not panicked, but he became very concerned. Uh, he could see a disaster happening here, a Franklin-type disaster. Um, investigator was trapped for three years, the Resolute's now trapped, so he became concerned. He ordered the captain of the Resolute to abandon the ship and march all the men back to where he was with the rest of the flotilla, and they would go searching further south for, for word of Franklin. The captain protested the order, but he had no choice. He had to obey. So he made the ship, shape, the ship as ship shape as possible. He had draped the flag over his chair in his master cabin, indicating that uh, he intended to come back. And then he marched his men from the Resolute back to the other parties of the flotilla. Now, 18 months later, and more than 1,200 miles away, the Resolute was discovered drifting by some American sealers, and they couldn't believe their luck. Uh, they took possession of the, the boat, the ship, they sailed it back to Connecticut, and they claimed the salvage rights of the ship, which was their, their right to do. Now, the American Congress debated what to do. America, the United States and Great Britain had been at war twice within the previous 80 years. But Britain was a natural partner to America, a natural trading partner, a, a natural uh, ally, a military ally. And it was still seen as a mother country by most Americans at that time. So Congress decided to spend $40,000, which was a fortune at that time in their economy, uh, to buy the ship and to rejuvenate it back to its original condition. And then they sailed it across the Atlantic and they presented it as a gift to um, uh, Queen Victoria, who came down to the wharf herself and on the 13th of December, 1856, and to accept this magnificent gift from the Americans. And historians now agree that the moment she stepped foot onto the deck of the Resolute was the start of what's now known as a special relationship between the United States and Great Britain. And then 25 years later, when the Resolute was decommissioned and it was being broken up um, to scrap, she, Queen Victoria ordered that the best timbers be used to create a desk. And she presented this desk to President Rutherford B. Hayes in 1880, and that's the desk that is used today in the Oval Office at the White House. Uh, the Resolute desk has been used by every president for the last 140 years. Um, so what stories that desk could tell? Wouldn't it be great? So now, every time you see um, TV footage or news footage of the Oval Office, you'll think back to this presentation and about to Franklin and his men. Now, in uh, 2014, the Erebus was found exactly where the Inuit had told Ray it was, uh, had sunk. And then almost two years to the day later, the uh, Terror was found as well. The Erebus isn't in very good condition. There's only a few items uh, left remaining there but the terror is in very good condition, apparently. The Canadian government have put a quarantine zone around it, a, an exclusion zone around it, and each year scientists go there trying to discover more about what happened to Franklin and his men. Uh, they were found 
This is where they, the ships became trapped and it looks like they broke out of that ice at some stage and uh, Terra was found here and Erebus down here. Um, exactly as I said, where the Inuit said they were, told where they were. Now, around the world, there's statues to Franklin. Uh, in Lincolnshire, his hometown, in Hobart, and of course in London. And I took a photo of the inscription on the one in London, uh, which is the same as the other ones, and it says, to the great Arctic navigator and his brave companions who sacrificed their lives in completing the discovery of the Northwest Passage. Now, that's obviously a little bit of politic, to poetic license there because they didn't complete anything. Uh, that honour actually went to a man we all know, Roald Amundsen. Um, he's, now, he's famous for being the very first person to reach the South Pole, but he was also the very first person to uh, trans, uh, go through the, the, uh, and find a route through the Northwest Passage, which he did between 1903 and 1906. And he virtually followed the same route that Franklin had taken, uh, but uh, was able to go further. And the whole idea of discovering the Northwest Passage became mute only 25 years after Franklin and his men had left England because the Suez Canal was opened and that was a faster, safer route to get through to the riches of the Indies. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the story of the Franklin expedition. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I've, um, as Nick said, I initially came on to do six talks. <laughs> that, was, that was the end of 15 of them. Um, it's been great fun. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it. Let me know if you've got a favourite. Um, we've this is our first time on P&O. Uh, we've really enjoyed it. Uh, if you, you wouldn't mind leaving some feedback or letting P&O if you've enjoyed the talks, that would be fantastic because we'd love to come back and do it again. Um, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank all the staff up in the control booth for, for their help. Um, <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, my lovely wife, Leanne, for her help. No, settle down, settle down. She does nothing. Um, <laughs> no, actually, she's great. I mean, we, we, we practiced this uh, at least three times before I actually inflict it upon you. So uh, she has to listen to it uh, all those times. So it's fantastic. And also, I'd like to thank you all for coming and supporting the talks. It's, it's been wonderful. The feedback that you've given me, um, the ideas for future talks has been fantastic as well. We'll be stuck in quarantine for the next 14 days, so uh, um, we'll have plenty of time to do some study. But um, wherever you're going, uh, please travel safely home to where your home is, um, and hopefully we'll see you again somewhere on the high seas in the future. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>